Well, good morning. Good morning. Would you pray with me briefly? Lord our God, thank you for bringing us together this morning and allow us as we turn to your word to have a new appreciation, a greater insight, refreshed eyes uh, to see your Messiah throughout Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it might surprise you all to learn, this is my fifth Advent season with you. I know. I was astounded. Yay, team. Yay, team. Ra ra ri. Take him in the knee. <laughs> ra ra rats. <laughs> oh boy. So uh, we have the most fun. Thank God for your laughter. Amen. Amen. Uh, so you all know, or should know, because I have taught you, uh, what Advent season is all about, its purpose, and why we celebrate it, and what we are celebrating. However, as all good teachers, uh, I appreciate the benefit of a review. So let us take a brief moment to review. Who remembers what the word Advent means? No need to raise your hand. Coming. Advent means coming. Very good. And whose coming are we anticipating? Yes, the Christ, Jesus. Very good. Now, here's a tough question. If Jesus already came, why are we still waiting for him? He's coming again. Hallelujah. And this is an important thing which our culture, and dare I say the American church, breezes past. And that is the fact that Advent is not the season of anticipation of Christmas, Christ's first coming. <gasps> oh, oh. I know. Hey, it's hard to come to terms with because that's what we've been taught since we were wee little tykes. But rather, it is primarily looking forward to Christ's second coming, his next Advent, because we are in between his first and second coming. His next advent is what we are presently in anticipation of, when he will return again and gather his church to himself. And then, as Paul tells the Thessalonians, we will be with the Lord forever. Amen. I hope over the years you all have gotten the impression that we are not negating Christ's first coming, however. It was important. It is still important. And of course, if it weren't for his first coming, there couldn't be a second coming. Now, with that said, my concern as the ever diligent historian is that we have begun to make Advent something it was never intended to be. I think there are several reasons for this, not least of all, uh, is this is principally driven by the culture and a period of time uh, which has become solely concerned with Christ's first advent, warm, fuzzy feelings about a baby in a manger, uh, and uh, for the church, uh, that baby in a manger, and for the culture, uh, the giving and especially receiving of gifts. Now, we, of course, see this in the fact that Christmas season starts earlier and earlier and earlier every year. I think this year the first Christmas things I saw were in October. Decorations and sales. In any case, we do well to continue to find balance in our approach to Advent. To keep in mind Christ's first coming as an integral part of God's plan and what makes possible looking forward to his next coming. Advent is a strategic time of preparation, of preparing to celebrate the first advent of Christ by putting focus onto the end, that is Christ's return. Now who remembers when Christmas formally starts? Oh, you guys are so smart. Sunset on Christmas Eve. And how long is Christmas season? Right again, 12 days. But I don't know where the birds come from. So, in connecting this future hope and remembering the past, we find ourselves in the present age, 
looking forward to the glorious reappearing of our Savior and looking forward to the remembrance of what we look back on. Namely, the entrance of the Savior into the world, while at the same time seeking Christ's likeness and carrying out our Christian duty as we wait for his next appearing. How's that for a sentence? This year, I want to take time to zoom out more than usual, to look fully at the whole story of Christ. And I have the, uh, I've had this idea of a series like this for Advent for some time, a series that endeavors to explore together the prophecy uh, that, that we know foretells Christ and to help us connect the dots of some of those prophecies in the scriptures uh, to uh, Christ, to help us as people on this side of the cross understand that, that Christ, the Messiah, didn't just appear at his birth in Bethlehem. And I know we know this, but let me ask you a question. Where does the story start? Where do we begin the drama of the long-awaited Messiah? In the beginning. beginning. Hot diggity dog. It's like he read my mind or the title of the sermon. (laughs) How about in Genesis 1-1? It might seem like an odd place to start, but it is where the Apostle John begins his gospel in the beginning. And so this Advent season, we are going to look through the scriptures, Old and New Testaments, to hopefully help us connect these dots through God's unfolding plan for salvation into eternity. It is my hope that we will achieve a fuller understanding of God's plan and how relate and how relationship to him is formed through it. Now, as I've been thinking about this over the past, what, two or three days since I wrote this. I think the best way to sum up what I'm trying to say is that we are going to find the Messiah in, the, in Scripture throughout Scripture. And we want to connect that with the baby in the manger and with the coming conquering king. It is uh, this babe who we have met. He is our Savior. He came into time, uh, born in Bethlehem. And he is also uh, the triumphant, conquering, eternal king, who we know, but have yet to meet face to face. And it's the anticipation that we now prepare for this Advent season. (laughs) One last word by way of introduction. We are not covering, we are, we are covering a lot of ground, but not plumbing the depths. Uh, rather, we are looking for general understanding of the context which we look at and how it fits into the larger picture. I know for some of us, you're thinking, great, maybe Pastor Mark will, you know. Anyway, read a couple of verses and sit down. But uh, don't worry, there'll still be plenty for all. Finally, I want to give credit to Alistair Begg, His book and study guide, Let Earth Receive Her King, uh, have been a great help to me in my preparation for this series. Uh, And so with all that said, let's go! (laughs) So the story begins not on the first pages of Matthew in the New Testament with an angel, a young woman, a betrothal, but rather in the beginning. And so that's our first point, which we must understand about the Messiah. The Messiah is eternal. The Messiah is eternal. And to be clear, when I say eternal here, I mean without beginning or end. From eternity past, what we understand as eternity before time through eternity future, he exists. And we might think of it as existing outside of or apart from time. If that's helpful for you, great. If thinking about time makes your head hurt, that's okay too. Uh, Whatever makes sense. The point is that we understand the Messiah began, didn't begin, was there in eternity past and will be there through eternity future. The word Messiah uh, is from Hebrew and the word Christ is from Greek. It's the same word, just different languages. They mean the same thing. 
Uh, it means anointed one, uh, or perhaps chosen in the sense of someone chosen, anointed to do a specific work for a specific purpose. You might find it interesting that in Israel, prophets, priests, and kings were all anointed ones. And so the Messiah, or Christ, capital M or C, the Messiah, or the Christ, is certainly anointed of God, as we will see, but is also the second person of the Godhead, that is the Son. And so when we see in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we rightly understand that the Messiah is there. And it's easy for us to turn to the Gospels and see Jesus introduced and draw the conclusion, ah, yes, I see, this is where the Messiah came to be. Here he is, Jesus in the manger. But that isn't correct. In Christ's first coming, we now see the Messiah has arrived in time with us. And so in a sense, it is true Christ arrived, came, the Messiah arrived or came. But this is a limited understanding because the truth is the Messiah was not created. He is eternal. And John helps us par parse this out in his gospel in chapter 1, where he writes, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And he was God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And so John here refers, though albeit a bit veiled, to the mystery, to the mystery, the mysteriousness, good English, of the Trinity. The Word was with God and was God. Another way to say that is the Word was all that God is. And was with God at the beginning. There's a lot of words there. Here's the point. Eternity passed before creation. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were there together. And John's emphasis here is that the Son, the Messiah, was there with them, taking part in creation. The point that John wants to make sure we get is that the Word, who we learn soon in his Gospel, took on flesh, dwelt among us as the person Jesus, and we call him Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, this is the same reference, is the second person of the Trinity, the Son. And he was with God in eternity past, before creation. It appears as if John is crediting him with creation. Now, it might be slicing the baloney too thin, to uh, quote one of my professors, to say that Christ uniquely created. But the point is that the Messiah was there in eternity past before creation because he is eternal. And just as there in the beginning, just as he was there in the beginning, he was there when the fullness of time came about, as Paul says in Galatians, and he came into time as a human baby, Jesus. And he will be there at the end of time to usher his people uh, into eternity with him. And it is this next Advent uh, that we are preparing for this Advent season and every Advent season. So the Messiah is eternal. The Messiah is the great rescuer. I suspect y'all are familiar enough with the gospel to know uh, that we are all sinners. Pretty basic in Christian understanding. Often, when we read the fall, that is from Genesis 3, uh, we read past the hope which is found in that chapter. I'm sure we are familiar with the story. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden as stewards, and they were to not eat the fruit from the one tree. That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And along comes the serpent, Satan, and convinces Eve, tricks her into believing the lie that he tells everybody, but we'll get to the lie in a moment. And she believes him, and she eats the fruit, and she gives some to her husband, who was there with her, Adam, and he eats too. And viola, sin, enters the world. And ever since then, humans have been separated from God, our creator, by sin. 
And so a war has waged between Satan and humankind. Perhaps more accurately stated, Satan has waged war against humankind since then. In Genesis 3.15, which is the section which contains the curse, the result of the fall, and we find a remarkably important and hopeful line. And it's referred to as the Proto-Evangelium. That is the first or perhaps prototype good news. Genesis 3.15 says, this is God speaking to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And this phrase, he will crush you he your head, this is the promise that is made. That the male offspring of the woman will crush the serpent's offspring's head. This is a death blow to the serpent's offspring. In other words, God would send a rescuer to undo the evil which Satan, through humanity, had brought onto the world. And though the details at this point in the story are sparse, we already see the promise of the Messiah, the great rescuer who would come, this offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's heel. And one day, it would be the one who would undo the evil done by the serpent, specifically by reconciling the offspring of the woman to God. It is no exaggeration to say that Satan had been attempting to prevent the Messiah from coming for thousands of years before Jesus was born. Indeed, this great conflict between the offspring of the woman, that is humanity, particularly humanity seeking God, and the offspring of the serpent, uh, those doing the bidding of Satan and his minions, and this is the great conflict of human history. It's the underlying plot throughout the entire Bible. And so by way of application, I, I would ask, in what areas of your life are you believing the lie of Satan? It's the same lie that Satan always uses. He says, I can give you a better life beyond the boundaries of God's plan without consequences. The problem is, is that once you get there, you quickly realize it was all a ruse. And you find yourself enslaved to sin. And you need to be rescued. The Messiah is this rescuer told all the way back in Genesis 3.15. He came in the manger. He gives the promise to those who are his. The work of Satan is undone in your life. And one day, at his next advent, he will gather us all together so that we will be with him forever in perfect, restored communion with our Creator. The Messiah is the great rescuer. And the Messiah is the promised Lamb. The promised Lamb. And we probably all take this point for granted because the Bible makes this very plain. It's quite clear. What is also of great importance is that the coming of this promised lamb is God keeping his promise. Specifically here, his promise to provide the sacrificial lamb, or we'll see in a second, a goat. And so as we look at Genesis 22, we have the story of Abraham's testing. God had called Abraham out of Ur to a new land, uh, we should be quite familiar with this because, again, I've taught you about it. And Abram obeyed God. And God said, Abram, if you obey me, I'm going to show you a new land and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you with land. I'm going to bless you with blessings. And I'm going to bless you with offspring. And your offspring are then going to bless all of creation, all of people. And so if we enter the story sometime after Isaac's birth, we'll look at chapter 22, starting in verse 1, uh, halfway through there. It says, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. And God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. 
Offer him up there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will indicate to you. So Abraham was in a terribly difficult spot. No explanation was offered, no instructions, no justification. Ready, set, Abraham, go. The son on whom the promises fall, through whom you will have offspring, through whom uh, the world is to be blessed. Remember, Abraham, I told you all these things. Well, you're going to sacrifice him to me. Ready, set, go. I can't imagine what Abraham was thinking. I, I know what I would have been thinking. Uh, well, Lord, uh, you see, it's, it's just the back pain. There's no way I could survive a trip. Uh, that's too far. And, and anyway, it seems like you, you might be confused because uh, you gave me this son and you're supposed to fulfill your promises through him. Yet oh, Abraham was obedient. He was faithful. And reading in verse 3, we see early in the morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey, took two of his young servants with him along with his son Isaac. When he had cut wood for the burnt offering, he started out for the place God had spoken to him about. And as they came to the place, Isaac finally speaks up uh, in verse 7, I'm paraphrasing, uh, Father, yes, son, I see that we have the wood, and you have the fire and the knife, uh, but where is the animal for sacrifice? And Abraham said back to his son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. And the two of them kept going. And so they arrive at the spot and Abraham builds the altar. He puts the wood on it. He binds his son. He sets his son on the altar and he prepares to slaughter him and to burn him as a sacrifice. Okay, time out. Now the only thing that I can come up with here is that either Abraham has lost his mind or and this is what the Bible actually says, Abraham had some next-level faith, and he believed God's promises. In fact, Hebrews tells us that Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so however God chose to fulfill this promise, namely the promise that it was through Isaac that he was going to make Abraham a nation, then so be it. Abraham had reconciled himself to trusting in God's promise, even if it meant sacrificing his son only to see God raise his son back up again. But as you all know, it didn't come to that. In verse 11, the angel of the Lord called out, Stop! Abraham, now I know that you fear the Lord. In other words, now I know that you have placed complete trust in the Lord God. And Abraham looked up, and there was a ram caught by the horns, the animal which God indeed provided for the sacrifice to himself. And isn't it interesting to note that Abraham said, the Lord will provide a lamb. But perhaps Abraham had a different lamb in mind. The lamb whom the Lord would provide 42 generations later. The lamb who was sent as a sacrifice to take away the sin of the world. And isn't it interesting that God provided the lamb for our sacrifice to him? It's just crazy. I didn't provide a lamb for my sacrifice to the Lord. And you didn't either, for that matter. And I didn't provide anything for the Lord of value. Yet he kept his promise and he provided the lamb and took away my sin. Amen. So we must not miss this. What God did for Abraham and what he has done for you and me is what he is doing in this age as we await Christ's next coming. It is the purpose of the church age. It is the purpose of his body, the church, his instrument to preach the gospel and make disciples. 
He has provided the promised lamb for sacrifice, and he is gathering a people to himself from every nation. He does this by saving a doctor here and a child there, by saving a grandmother, a great-grandmother on her deathbed, and a college student on their knees in the night. He saves people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Think about how many millions will worship Christ this holiday season, this Christmas, gathering to sing praises to him, gathering to worship the newborn king. And think of how many millions, billions even, perhaps even more, will gather at his next coming, singing his praises, glorifying him forever and ever. This is God's doing in fulfillment of his ancient promise. And so as we prepare this Advent, take time this week to reflect on this truth, that Jesus died for your sins and rose again from the dead. And think through the lies of Satan that you are believing Perhaps jot them down. Confess them to the Lord. I pray that over the coming weeks we will see our Messiah with fresh eyes of wonder and thanksgiving. With a renewed awe at God's plan for the ages. At God's plan to send the Messiah (coughs) once as the baby born in Bethlehem the Lamb of God sent to take away the sin of the world, and now coming again as the King to gather his people to himself and to reign forever and ever. Today we began our Advent series, The Long-Awaited Messiah. We began our search to find the Messiah throughout Scripture in the beginning. We looked at three scriptures from Genesis We connected them to what we see in the manger and who we anticipate returning for us. The Messiah, the one who is eternal, the one who strikes the serpent's head, who rescues us, and the one who is the fulfillment of God's promise to provide the sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God, come to take the sin of the world. Would you pray with me? Lord our God, Lord, cause us to be still as we come before you this morning. And as we again consider uh, your son Jesus, the Messiah, and even as we uh, work through this series seeking to understand the full picture of who the Messiah is and where we find him in Scripture, Lord, give us a renewed sense of awe at your goodness, at your plan for the ages, of your total and complete mercy and grace which you have poured out for us. Draw us near to you, Lord, and speak to our hearts. We know that your glory is forever, and it is in great anticipation of Christ's return to usher us into that forever uh, that we prepare and celebrate. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.